Today on the Bandrew Says Podcast, we'll be discussing the official announcement from YouTube of Chapter Markers. I'll be answering a whole bunch of your questions, so go ahead and stick around. On the 28th of May, YouTube officially announced the release of Chapter Markers. And if you're not aware of what these are, in the timeline of a video, it will now break down the video into sections based on the topic area. So for a viewer, This makes for an incredibly great viewing experience. And what I am hoping that this does is it sets a precedent to stop wasting viewers' time. The amount of creators that I'm aware of who just fluff out their video to try to irk out a little bit of additional watch time to try to gain favor in the YouTube algorithm is insane, and it bothers me so much. Your viewer's time is valuable, and you should not be wasting it. You should be trying to convey the information they are there for in a short amount of time as possible so they can be on their way. And as I have discussed in prior episodes, yes, this may hurt your watch time, but what it gives you in return is a happy viewer. A viewer who leaves your video thinking, that was great, I got what I wanted. Now, if anybody wants me to share where I got that information, I know where to direct them. So you are losing watch time, but you are gaining favor with your viewer, and you are much more likely to get that that word-of-mouth promotion. And with this announcement, I went back and looked at the timeline, no pun intended, of the rollout of this feature. The experiment appeared to start on April 10th. I noticed it on April 12th, and I tweeted about it. And then on May 28th, it was out of the experiment phase, and it seems to be rolling out to a wide amount of viewers, and I am not sure if it's all creators, but I think it may be. But if you are a creator who wants to add chapter markers to your video, I will link the announcement, the explanation on how to add them from Google, as well as a video clip that I made about how to add them to your video as well, and I will link them all in the show notes. And that is it for the news. Very short, very sweet There may be other tech news going on, but I have not been paying attention to the news at all. I am sure you are fully aware why, and you may be wondering why I am not discussing everything that's going on in the world. I am not an authority in that arena, and there are much better people to listen to discussing that topic. And I view this podcast as a distraction from the real world, a little bit of an escape to some place that isn't just focusing on the horrors. And I think that's pretty important right now. Everywhere you look seems to be talking about horrific ordeals. And I don't want to be adding to that fear. I don't want to be adding to the anxiety that a lot of people are feeling right now. I just want to provide something that might allow somebody to escape for a little bit of time. So that is why I am approaching everything the way that I am. Let's go ahead and jump directly to... My favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. All right, welcome to the Ask Bandrew segment. If you have any questions that you want answered on a future episode of the show, you can send in audio, video, or an email. Just go to askbandrew.com. There are instructions on how to send all of that in. I personally love the video, I love the audio, I also love the text, but I suck at reading, and I know it's painful to listen to me read, (laughs) so (laughs) if you want to do yourself a favor, and if you want to do everybody listening to this a favor, send in an audio or video. I try to make it as easy as possible. Let's jump to the very first submission, and it is a video submission from Pablo. Pablo, take it away, good sir. Hey, Bandrew, this is Pablo. Thank you very much for your podcast. I really like it. So right now I have a Roll Video Micro out of frame right here, about one foot away from my mouth. I am using a TRS splitter cable to my Mac, and I don't really like the sound out of it. For comparison, this is the sound I get from a Blue Snowball Ice, and of course this mic picks up a lot of background noise. That's why I want to start using the Video Micro. So I wonder if I should get like a Zoom H1N or something similar. I don't know about that because I don't want to buy the thing and then realize that the sound is almost the same. Do you have a Zoom H1 or something similar to test it with a Rode Video Micro? I wonder if there is a big difference using the Mac or the external recorder. Thank you very much. 
Pablo. Thank you very much for that question. I appreciate you sending that in. And what a great question. I just so happened to have the Rode Video Micro. I had it in a box and I hadn't opened it. <laughs> so I went ahead and opened that. I recorded it directly to my Mac using a 3.5 millimeter cable extension to a TRRS splitter. And then I recorded directly into the Zoom H1. And here is that very quick test and comparison. Okay, so first off, I have the Rode Video Micro running over a 3.5 millimeter extension into a TRRS splitter. That is connected directly into my Mac and my gain is set at around 50%. And here is how the audio sounds. And now I have the Rode Video Micro connected to the original Zoom H1. The input level is set to 75. And here is how the audio compares between the two. All right, we are back in the current, present, where we are recording, not in the past when we had been rec I'm confused already. <laughs> what I heard is there was clearly a difference between recording the mic directly to the Mac versus directly to the H1. It wasn't the hugest difference, but I did notice a bit more bass and fullness to it. When I was recording direct into the 3.5 millimeter TRRS splitter, it almost sounded like there was a high pass and it sounded a bit more harsh. So if you're willing to spend $100 to get that little bit of improvement, I did notice it. But if not, if you didn't notice a difference, if you don't think that's worth the $100, Although I think now the Zoom H1, the original one, not the Zoom H1n, might be going for around 70, maybe 50 or 60. So check that out. That may be worth it. And then you don't have to run directly into your computer. You can get a slightly better sound. Still not going to be incredible, though. I was not terribly impressed with the sound quality of the microphone in general from a distance of about a foot. But I hope that helped you make your decision, Pablo. Thank you so much for asking it. I appreciate you. Next, we got a question from Walter, and he sent in an email saying, When I listened to your RE320 vs. Procaster, I agree it did seem harsh, especially the sibilance. But when compared to your more recent EVRE comparison with all three RE microphones, the RE320 sounded a lot better on your voice. The difference in sibilance is noticeable between the two videos on the RE320. Did you happen to use different settings for that video or lower gain? Thank you, Walter. Alrighty, Walter, very good question. So right now I'm speaking into the Rode Procaster and then in a little bit I will switch to the RE320. There should not have been any difference in the settings for either of those recordings, the RE320 versus the Procaster or the roundup of the 320, the 20, and the 27ND, mainly because I don't do anything to the audio in post. The only thing that could have changed would have been the way that I was speaking. And that is exactly why I keep the microphones that I review, so I can go back and do future comparisons between microphones. You can get a general baseline by listening to a review of a microphone I did three years ago, and then a review of a different microphone I did today. But the best option would be listening to the different microphones recorded at the same time or within 30 seconds of each other. Because as time goes on, your voice changes, you speak differently, the environment you're in changes. There are multiple factors that will affect the tone of a recording. But listening back to both of these, I do still hear the RE20, RE20? the RE320, being a bit more sibilant than the Procaster. The Procaster is a bit darker, still has a little bit of detail, but darker. 320, very bright, very crisp, very detailed, but a bit sibilant. Hope that helped you. Thank you for asking the question. We are back in the present, and we have a voice submission from the absolute mad lad, Chaz. Chaz, take it away, good sir. Andrew, I may be in the minority here, but I think you have a nice speaking voice. I absolutely love listening to the BSP every time a new episode drops. Also, you have a really nice raspiness to your voice. I don't think you realize that. I know there have been times where I've been kind of envious of it. <laughs> anyway, I have a couple of questions. Question number one. I feel like whenever you post a microphone or interface review, this isn't mentioned a whole lot in the comments section, but 
Your music demonstrations are absolutely amazing. Have you ever considered recording and producing your very own album or EP? What would you write about in your songs? Also, I would be one of the first in line to purchase your original music. Question number two. The weather's getting hot and summer is right around the corner. What are your, lack for a better term, strategies when recording during the summertime, and what sort of advice would you give to everyone recording at home? Chaz, thank you so much for the kind words. That really does mean the world to me, especially coming from you and how good your voice always sounds and how good your recordings always sound. So thank you so much. You are too kind. To your first question, would I produce a full album or an EP? And what would I sing about? I have many times thought about recording an album and putting it out. I actually have maybe a dozen songs written and recorded. They are goofy. They are dumb. They are not serious. I don't think they're very good, but I have fun. The last five or six years, I have just written and recorded songs and demoed them for the sake of doing it. Just because it's something that's fun to do on occasion and it's an escape. I never really got into the mindset of I have to do this every day to improve. It really just became I am going to do this when I feel inspired. And the thing that I struggle with the most about songwriting are the lyrics. I don't think that that part of my brain really works. The whole communicating emotional or introspective ideas, I can't do that. So the lyrics I write, I find to be very boring, and it's not even in the sense of storytelling. It's not folk singing. It's bordering on vain, where everything is just me, 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 me. I feel this. I experience that. Wah, wah, wah. Nobody cares, Badger. Shut up. <laughs> That's what my lyrics are like, and it is very... I'm very self-conscious about it because I don't think they're very good. And my guess would be it's because when I listen to music, I very rarely connect to the lyrics. The main thing that I focus on and am moved by are the harmony and the melody. That's why I really love classical music or just instrumental music in general because it allows for much more interplay between the harmony and the melody. When you get into vocal jazz, yes, you do have some similar interplay, and there are some very incredible recordings there. But with symphonic music, I really am moved by the harmony and the melody playing off of each other. And some of my favorite music ever made, I don't know what they're singing about. I don't know what they're singing about in the magic flute, other than the fact that it may be about a magic flute. Look up the Queen of the Night aria. That aria will make you weep. It is beautiful. It is incredible. And I don't know what they're singing about. So what I would write about, I don't know. Something about me feeling something and saying, oh, I was sad. I ran into this. I ate pizza. I reviewed a microphone. Dumb stuff like that. Or what I have done is write lyrics based on TV shows or movies because I don't have to feel anything then. (laughs) I don't have to feel anything. The people who write the movie can feel stuff. The people who act in the movie can feel stuff. And I can just act as a scribe. I can act as a translator into the musical format. (laughs) That's crazy. I will also say that something I struggle with in regards to writing music is my technical proficiency. I do have a working knowledge of music and instruments, but my grasp isn't deep enough to understand the emotions that certain chord changes or certain keys will evoke. And that kind of bums me out when I start thinking about it because I don't start writing a song and think, here's what I want to convey And here's how I will convey that. I want to convey a sad emotion, so here is what I do. All I do is, this is a sad song, I'll put it in a minor key. I don't think what chords or what key changes might elevate that emotional idea. Normally, I just sit down and think, hey, let's see what sounds good. What chord progression sounds good? What melody sounds good? And because of this, I find a lot of the music that I make in my opinion, sounds a little bit sterile and lifeless, and it doesn't convey 
a whole lot of personal idea, a whole lot of personality. It is very here's a chord progression and here's a melody. There's no tension there, which is what I think makes for great music. And I'm fully aware that in answering your question, this turned into me just sharing my insecurities and my critical analysis of my songwriting. But stick around to the end of the show, Chaz. I will have a a surprise there for you and anybody else who wants to stick around and it will be of the musical variety. So stick around for that. I hope I hope you enjoy that. The second question you had was strategies for recording during the summertime. I know people will hate me for saying this, but if you're recording in the summertime when it is hot and warm and you are sweating, turn off your AC, turn off your fans. Your audience does not care if you're hot, if you're sweating. They don't care about that at all. They just want a good sounding recording. The way that I approach this is I will run my AC and turn it down a few extra degrees to cool off the room a little bit more than usual. Then before I record, I flip off the air conditioner, shut off any fans that are going, and then I record. And hopefully I don't screw up too much. So I am able to record within 30 minutes, maybe an hour and a half, and then turn on the AC while I edit and get back to normal internal heat so I am not dying of heat exhaustion so that is my approach and I think a lot of people should do that if they are not recording for eight hour sessions because if you're recording for eight hour sessions that's going to be difficult you may have to break up the recording session and do an hour and a half take a 30 minute break run the AC hour and a half take a 30 minute break run the AC so on and so forth That is what I would recommend. Chaz, thank you so much for the voice submission. You sound wonderful. Thank you so much for the questions. And thank you so much for the kind words. You are incredible. Next, we have an email from Slava. They say, Hello, Bandrew. I've recently ordered my first microphone, which is the Behringer XM8500. I could not buy the Q2U here in Russia, so I've ordered a USB to XLR cable to begin with. But even now, when I'm still waiting for the mic... I could not wait to buy an audio interface and other future upgrades. So here is my question. Could you please tell me about 48 volts phantom power on different interfaces? As far as I understand, some of them such as the Focusrite 2i2 3rd or Zoom H5 or way many more to name all apply phantom power to all of the inputs. And other interfaces such as the Mo2 M2 or Audient Evo 4 have an on and off switch for each individual input. How would it work if I would connect dynamic and condenser mic at the same time to an interface which will power up all inputs without individual control? Thanks so much for your content. Hopefully the new mic will come soon and my next submission will be recorded. With respect, Slava, a fellow podcaster from across the globe. Slava, thank you so... I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I am probably not, just like I did not pronounce Sayuz correctly. Please correct me when you do get your microphone sent in a voice submission and say, Bandrew, you idiot. That's not how I pronounce my name. Here is how I pronounce it. Here is how you should pronounce it. (laughs) Send that in and let me know when you get your microphone. Can't wait to hear from you. Greetings from the United States. Hope everything's going well for you out in Russia. And yes, that is true. Most affordable interfaces, when you turn on phantom power, that will turn on phantom power for all of the XLR inputs. As far as running dynamic and condenser microphones simultaneously, why did I pronounce it that way? Simultaneously, simultaneously? I don't know which one's right. Tell me which one is the correct way to pronounce it. Now I'm questioning everything because I screwed up your name. If you're using the XM8500, it should not screw up that microphone because it is designed well enough to avoid being destroyed by phantom power. I have read multiple times that 48 volts phantom power can damage poorly wired dynamics as well as ribbon microphones. Of all the dynamics that I have reviewed, I have not come across a single one that has been damaged by phantom power. Actually, there was one. It was a $7 or $8 dynamic and when I turned on phantom power, it got this horrendous buzz. So there was some kind of funky wiring on that. 
I don't remember which one it was. It may have been one that looks like it belongs on the Jersey Shore. I think the thumbnail even said the Jersey Shore of microphones. I am I can't remember exactly. But the XM8500 does not suffer from that, so you should be perfectly fine running the XM8500 with a condenser microphone. No issues whatsoever. Hope that helps you. Thank you so much for the question and the email. Stay safe out there. Next, we got a video submission from Arthur. So, Arthur, take it away. Hey, Ben Drew. Um, hope you're doing well. I do have a question for you for dual mic setup. So, my use case is pretty much um, I have like a static blue ember here, which sounds good. Um, and also, I have like a small lav I can carry around and um, interact with when I'm picking up some gadget here or like uh, my video gear cabinet, whatever. Um, and I wanted to know if you had any experience, any like tips to make this work and make this work for longer distance. So for instance, uh, if I want to go for a wireless mic uh, and just like keep talking, switching like to a different camera on a different room and still being able to um, get the good sound on my static corded mic and do like something proper where you actually get something decent um, with like a, a wireless one. All right, cheers. Arthur, what an excellent, excellent question. And I have to say, that is such an intuitive and clever way to set things up where you side chain the lavalier microphone so that it is turned off when you are speaking into your condenser. And I will explain what side chaining is in case anybody out there is not familiar. It is a unique approach to compression. Normally, when you are compressing something, you're running a microphone into the compressor. If you set your threshold at negative 10 decibels, you speak into your microphone and the sound source exceeds negative 10 dB, then that sound source will be compressed. What side chaining does is it allows you to compress a sound source based on some other sound that is triggering the compressor. You hear this a lot in electronic music where the synthesizers are compressed based on the kick drum. So when the kick drum hits, all the synthesizers are compressed and they decrease in volume. Then when the compressor releases, you hear the volume of the synthesizers come back up and fade back in based on the release of the compressor. It gives you that very, not thumping, but it gives you that, I can't think of the word right now. My, I'm having a brain fart. But you know what I am talking about. Do you know what I am talking about? Now you know what I am talking about. <laughs> I turned into butters for a second. If you've listened to electronic music, you have heard it. You know what I am talking about, but I can't think of the words right now. One issue that I do see with this setup would be that when you aren't talking, the lav mic would not be side-chained. It would not be decreased in volume. So you're going to get a lot of the noise from the lav mic when you are silent and you are not talking into the condenser mic, the blue ember, which you sound great on, by the way. The only other option that I can think of here would be to have some kind of mixer that has mute buttons for each channel. Then when you are leaving your setup and walking around, you can mute the blue ember and unmute the lav mic so you could go out and talk into that and not have any bleed from the condenser microphone. As far as wireless lav mics, I will admit up front that I am no expert. I am not well versed in this market. You may want to check out Sound Speeds or Curtis Judd. I know they do a lot more with the film side of things, which incorporate a lot more lav mics, so check out their channels. But if I had to pick up a wireless lav mic right now, I probably would go with the Rode Wireless Go because I know quite a few people who have picked that up and they are very happy with how the sound is, how well it functions, and how easy it is to use. So if I had to pick one up, I would go with the Rode Wireless Go. Sorry, I can't be more help in terms of selecting the wireless lav. I just don't want to put out information that I am not well informed on. And I know there are other people out there who are much more informed on the topic area who could probably give you much better advice. But thank you so much for the video submission, Arthur. I appreciate you, and I hope that helped 
in any way, shape, or form. If not, I hope I praised you sufficiently because, again, that is a really clever and intuitive way to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish with that side chain compression. Really, really cool idea there. You should make a video on that because I am sure there are plenty of people who would be interested in implementing something similar for a dual mic setup. If you do do that, do do. If you do that, go ahead and send me a link to that and I will include it in a future episode or something and share it around because really cool stuff. Thank you very much. Next, we got an email from Chitro Deep. I apologize. I butchered your name. I came to know from your video that condenser microphones require additional 48 volts from an audio interface and dynamic microphones doesn't require any such additional power. But what if I connect a dynamic mic to an audio interface? Will that do any good? And one thing more, sir, I have large background noise, so should I buy dynamic microphone or a condenser microphone? I don't want to compromise my recording quality. Please help, sir. Chitro Deep. Again, I apologize for butchering your name. Thank you so much for the question. This is similar to a prior question. With most dynamic microphones, you will not require phantom power. I would venture a guess and say 99.999%. You do not require phantom power. And I would venture a guess again that maybe 95% of dynamic microphones will not be damaged by phantom power. Will phantom power improve the quality of dynamic microphones? No. Nope, 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 nope. Not at all. Dynamic microphones gain no benefit whatsoever from phantom power. It is just doesn't affect it at all. As far as the background noise, in most cases, generally speaking, a dynamic microphone does tend to do better at background noise rejection and something like the Behringer XM8500 would do pretty well for you. It sounds pretty darn great for $20, very affordable, very well built, and I think it's a great starting option. If you want to go a little bit higher, you could go something like the SE Electronics SEV7, the Sennheiser E835, or if you want to go even higher, something like the SM7B or RE20 if you're looking at the top tier. So to conclude my response, phantom power does not affect the sound of dynamic microphones, and most of the time it will not damage your dynamic microphones. And if you want the least amount of background noise picked up in your recording, in most cases, dynamic microphones will do a better job at rejecting that compared to condensers. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shitro Deep, for the email and the question. Hope that helped. Best of luck to you. Lastly, we have a voice submission from Todd. Take it away, Todd. Hey, Bandrew. Thanks for taking my question. I really appreciate it. I'm a huge fan of the podcast now for the last, you know, couple of months is it. I was a longtime fan of the YouTube channel, but uh, finally found the podcast and I really appreciate what you're doing, man. It's uh, always gives me another 30, 45 minutes to uh, geek out on audio and whatnot. So uh, thanks a bunch. Keep it up. Uh, I'm a voiceover person. So naturally, I'm always thinking about audio, always thinking about microphones, always thinking about upgrading my setup in whatever way I can. So here's my dilemma. I know this might be frowned upon, but what I do is I've always had Bose headphones and I love them. They're comfortable. I can wear them literally for 10 hours straight and it's fine. But they're the QC35s. They're noise canceling. And that's not what you're supposed to be using if you're going to be professionally mixing stuff and charging people for it, right? But I just, you know, I plug it into my focus right and I don't have the headphones turned on and, you know, noise canceling engaged. So there's no noise canceling happening. And I love the way they sound. I love how comfortable they are. But I was like, well, you know, I'm getting quite a bit of work here. So I should try to do everything I can to be as professional as possible. And if getting studio monitoring headphones is going to help me, then, well, I better do that if it's going to help me do a better job. That was my rationale. So I got some great monitoring headphones. Now, they sound way different. And I don't know if I like it. They sound good. I do hear some more detail in music, I feel like, but I don't know. They're not as comfortable, that's for sure. I mean, I'll probably get used to them. I guess what I want to know is, is it okay that I'm using my QC35s for monitoring or 
Is it important that I just get away from that and just use these studio headphones until I get used to them? Or is it just okay to do whatever I feel like is best for me? Any input would be appreciated. Thanks again. Todd, what an excellent, excellent, excellent question. Thank you so much for asking it. I don't have the typical audiophile thought process here. My thought process is as long as you understand what your headphones sound like, as long as you know what a good vocal recording sounds like on the headphones you're using, you should be 99% okay using those. If you want a little bit of extra detail, if you want some added clarity, if you want to get very clinical and analytical, yes, some other headphones may be beneficial to give you that added benefit, that added sound signature that you need to do that. But if you know what a good voice recording sounds like when you're using the QC35s, it's not that difficult to mimic that. You can go in and adjust your processing to fit to the sound of that good sounding vocal recording, regardless of the headphones you're using. As long as you have a reference, it is okay, in my opinion, to use pretty much whatever headphones you want. Now, as far as your question on whether or not you should just bite the bullet and switch, my response would be, why not both? Why not both? You can do both. Continue to use your QC35s because you're comfortable with them. And when you want more detail, switch over to the more analytical pair to fine tune the recording, hear that additional detail and make any further adjustments, then jump back to the QC35s, determine if you do think it was an improvement, whatever it may be. If you do want to go this route though, you cannot just throw on those more analytical studio monitor headphones when you want that detail. You still need to get a very firm understanding of how they sound, what music sounds like through them, what good vocal recordings sound like through them. Otherwise, when you throw them on, all you'll be hearing is the different tone of the headphones and you'll think that your recording is completely different. So you still need to spend time getting to know the headphones, listen to music on them, listen to audiobooks on them, listen to other voice actors on them that you know sound good on the QC35s, and then as you get to know those more analytical, more detailed studio monitors, you'll be able to just toss them on when you want a little bit of added information, a little bit of a different approach to the sound that you're listening to so you can make further adjustments and be more critical. Regardless of the headphones you use, the final product is what matters. And if you're outputting high quality recordings and your clients are happy, using the QC35s doesn't matter. They could not care less what headphones you're using. All they care about is the final product. Don't listen to everybody saying, if you want to be a professional, you need this. Who gives a what any of these people say? Screw them if they think you need item X, Y, or Z to be a professional. No. I have had this conversation a few times with somebody. I am sure there are plenty of electronic producers who would say, you can't be professional if you use KRK rocket speakers. Screw you. Look at Skrillex. He released his first EP that blew him up. He recorded that and mixed it on freaking blowing KRK rocket monitors. Don't listen to these people saying, you can't use booze. Uh, uh, I'm an audio... F Shut up. Shut up. If you know what you're doing, if you understand those headphones, you can make good recordings with it. As long as you're not getting complaints, go forth, kick butt, and keep making great sound and stuff, Todd. I appreciate the question, and I hope that gave you your answer. Thank you so much. And that is all. Those are all of the questions that we will be addressing this week. I don't know if we'll be back to the regular format next week because I don't know if I'm going to be able to look at the news. I cannot look at it right now. It is. It's driving me nuts. Okay. As I alluded to in one of the questions, there would be a musical ending to this show. So because of how distressing the last few weeks have been, I have kind of fallen back into music and just escaped into it. I've been listening to it. I have been playing it, learning it, recording it, goofing off and trying to not pay attention, trying to get a little bit of 
levity over the anxiety that I think everybody is feeling. So I recorded a cheesy, uplifting song that's going to be on the Bandrew Plays channel coming up on Thursday, but I thought some of y'all might enjoy it. And because I am doing this to try to act as a distraction, try to provide some uplifting content, I thought I would share it here. In the meantime, you are getting a Sclusi, an exclusive here. So I hope it gives you a few minutes of joy. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening to this show. I appreciate you so much. Stay safe. I love you. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you. And here is the musical surprise. Thank you all so much. See you next week. Bye. Just remember what your old pal said You've got a friend in me 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 You've got troubles I've got them too isn't anything I wouldn't do for you We'll stick together, we can see it through You've got a friend in me You've got a friend in me Some other folks might be A little bit smarter than I am Bigger and stronger too But none of them will ever love you the way I do It's me and you, boy And as the years go by Our friendship will never die You're gonna see it's our destiny You've got a friend in me You've got a friend in me You've got a friend in me This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.